<laughs> we need one of those signs, you know. <laughs> Clap it, please. So I'm here with Mr. X, and uh, <laughs> he's going to ask me some things about this recent video, which seems to have really thrown everybody for a loop. What do, what do you think? Uh, I was watching the video, actually. It was a bomb, and it was so deep. So I need to understand it further. I mean, to, I, I, I mean it, it will help the audience as well. So can you further explain it? Can you make it uh, more simple? Well, I'm trying to explain what I see, what I experience every day in terms of this traditional Upanishad, mm -hmm. which is very good because it sets a context, a background, a, a, a world in which this conversation is even possible. <laughs> See, as long as we have a story that is rooted in duality, you know, that I was born of so-and-so parents, <laughs> and I belong to this family and this community <laughs> and this nation and so on and yeah. so on. As long as we think in those terms, what we're trying to say here is completely counterintuitive. You know? Yeah. And the reason for that is it comes from a different state of consciousness, actually. Mm -hmm. You know, we've been teaching these four states of consciousness now. For what, seven years? Mm -hmm. At least. And um, it's like people don't understand that when you're in one state of consciousness, the world looks like it's real. When you're in Jagrat mm -hmm. consciousness, yeah. right? The body seems to be the self. Yes. I seem to be, I have to, uh, an identity, mm -hmm. an ego yeah. that's defined in terms of the world yes. and its various mm -hmm. forms and names and all this. But then, when I go to sleep at night and I go into dreams, mm. all that disappears. Gone. Bye-bye. <laughs> like it never existed. Yeah. And you find yourself in another body, in mm -hmm. another world, with these other people that you don't even know who they are. You don't even <laughs> know their names. And yeah. uh, instead of being lit from the outside, like by the sun, mm. the visions in dreams seem to be like self-luminous or mm -hmm. self-illuminated. Yeah. I mean, the whole thing is different. Mm -hmm. The world is different. Yeah. And then when you go into Sushupti, even that goes away. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> you're, you're in nowhere. See, there's nothing. Yes. So we're still conscious, but there's no objects to be no conscious objects. of. And the reason is that in Sushupti, Sushupti consciousness is only cause. It's not the effect of anything. So there are no impressions, there are no perceptions. There's no way to gauge whether you are conscious or not. So most people just give it up and say, well, I was unconscious. I was out, man, I was out like a light. Because there was no object. Right. So dreams they can somewhat remember because they do have objects and although they're not often not the objects of this world or even related to this world. Uh, anything, any kind of weird thing can happen in a dream. And people kind of take that in stride, like, yeah, it was weird, but so what? It was just a dream. But then, when they wake up, they say, no, the dream was not real. But wait a minute, when you're in the dream, it's perfectly real. See, and when you're in Sushupti, there really is no world. Nothing happening. So, Shankara says that people become conditioned in this material world out of delusion mm -hmm. and out of a feeling of loss. Grief. Yes, greed. Grief. Uh, I lost my last body. My last body went away and disappeared, and now I need a new one. Right? And when you're in Sushupti, you're at cause. So if you get panicky and you start thinking, oh, I need a body, and before you know it, <laughs> you got one. <laughs> it just might not be, you know, well, it's certainly not going to be an optimum body. It's not going to be a perfect body. It's going to be a conditioned body 
you know, if you're watching this video, a human body on planet Earth in Kali Yuga, <laughs> and there's going to be suffering. It's inevitable. There's going to be suffering associated with that existence. So how do we get out of the suffering? We get back to our original consciousness, which is not in this world. It's in, well, it begins in Svapna, in dreams, by devotion. By devotion, we can go to higher worlds, higher existences, higher contexts, until finally we're ready to realize the truth that everything is Brahman. Everything is Brahma. Sarva Kalvidang Brahma. But what does that mean? It means that everything that we normally in, in Jagra consciousness think we are is actually a lie. A lie. Yeah. A construction, a fabrication. From the world. From? The world. Yeah, we take like the elements of the world and we combine them mm -hmm. along with memories and the desires to, you know, have and be and do, yeah. think and know certain things. And uh, you put, all, put that all together and find a suitable womb and there you go, you get a new body, <laughs> courtesy of Mother Nature. Mother Nature is the servant, the slave of Shiva. And, as we've asserted many times, Shiva is Sushupti. So when you get deprived of the body and you wind up in Sushupti, you're like freaking out. Where's my body? Who am I? What am I? You know? And you have all these memories and you also have all these purposes and desires. And so that becomes the Shankara that creates your new mind and, new body, mind and body, along with this environment and world and level of consciousness. Yes. And so see, this whole teaching is like one integrated whole that applies to all sides and factors and uh, everything in life, you know. Um, but, you know, we only have like a 15 or 20 minute at the most uh, window for these videos. This one's probably going to be longer, but that's okay. So how can we discuss all that holistic field, you know, in one video? It's just not possible. Yeah. Or it would have to be completely superficial. Mm -hmm. But I like to go deep into things, you know? I like to tinker with stuff. I like to get up under the hood and <laughs> mess around and try different things and see what happens. So uh, I always have the orientation that when I talk about something... It's something I've experienced. Yes. Or it's something that I'm committed to uh, as an ontological commitment, which, in other words, I'm going to become that or I am that. So uh, it's not just a simple process of material transformation. You know, like the New Age people are always saying <laughs> transformation. transformation. Well, transformation means illusion because change is temporary. And uh, the very first instruction Krishna gives Arjuna in Bhagavad Gita is that that which is real is always existing. And what is unreal never exists. Huh? And the classic example is the rope and the snake. Rope and the snake. Yeah. Now the snake is real to the person who sees it because they're half asleep. Mm -hmm. They're in Svapna. Mm -hmm. They have one foot in Svapna and one foot in Jagra. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right? So they don't see the rope. They see their idea, of the, which is the snake. Yeah. Right? And it's real to them mm -hmm. because they're in a different state of consciousness. Ta-da! Ta see how that works? So what we need is a theory of relativity of consciousness. Uh -huh. That what looks real in one state of consciousness is completely a dream, a fantasy, a fabrication, oh. a projection, or whatever, in another state. Hmm. Yeah. Like, I can't count the number of times, like waking up in the morning, when I really wanted to stay in that space, just between dreams and awakening. 
Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And I really, I, like this morning, I, w I stayed in bed for about two hours just meditating, not thinking, uh, just being, <laughs> you know, in that space between. Dream and wake. Yes, because in that space you can perceive Turiya. Uh -huh. Turiya is in the Sandhya, the junction uh -huh. between the two different states of consciousness. It's also there between Swapna and Sushupti, but it's much harder to access. Yeah. Whereas we pass through this junction between waking and dreaming twice a day at least. So uh, coming out of dreaming is, is especially good. That's why the recommended practice is meditation first thing in the morning. You know, you get up early, maybe you're a little sleep deprived. <laughs> Get up at 4, 4.30 in the morning and you're kind of uh, half asleep. Sit down and meditate. And of course, you're going to find yourself between the two states. And that's right where you want to be because you don't want to identify with either of them, but you want to see the substrata beneath that. So, and this, this to me is an everyday experience. So, you know... It's hard for me to imagine or to remember what it was like to be conditioned by all that. See, I became a seeker when I was three and a half years old. I was consciously on the path from that time because I remembered who I was in my past life. By three and a half years? Yeah, when I was about two and a half to three and a half years old, I, I used to be able to recall quite clearly events from my previous life. And then they went away for a while, but then recently, well recently, last 20 years or so, 25 years, uh, I've been able to more and more clearly recall in ordinary waking consciousness mm -hmm. who I was in my previous life. So can you explain it? I mean, from for for your last word. Well, I was that I was there, and then I'm then I'm here. Well, actually, I'm still there because there isn't here. Uh, um, what? <laughs> <laughs> what? I was or am actually uh, a servant of the mother in Shivaloka. Okay. And she kind of gave me an assignment to come here and talk about these truths to the people here. That's what I'm doing here. And that's, that's why, you know, I've been given certain kinds of protection and stuff like this, you see. But, but the place where I'm from is like really different. I mean, it's really wildly different from this place. So it's been difficult for me to get things across to the, the natives, you know. <laughs> it's like I'm speaking a different language or yeah. it, it seems uh, counterintuitive to them. Yes. Because of the way they think, which I, I admit, I don't understand. I don't understand the way they think. I can't remember being like that, you know. Uh, since I was three and a half years old, I was always like, what is spiritual? What is enlightenment? What is God? How can I communicate with those levels of my own consciousness? Right? I mean, I remember very vividly being impressed by the statement of the Bible, the kingdom of heaven is within you. Yeah. And I'm like, well, why don't I hear this on Sunday morning? You know? <laughs> What are these people doing? I don't get it. Oh. I, how they can be so wrapped up in only material stuff. I, I mean, don't you ever question? They you don't. Know, what am I doing here? <laughs> why is this place the way it is? Yeah. You know, and why am I here? And uh, what's it all about? And, you know, like <laughs> the higher truths and all. Doesn't that ever, like, come up? For a lot of these people, I guess not. They don't allow to question. They don't. Who doesn't allow? <laughs> mama don't allow no questions around here. <laughs> well, I don't care what Mama don't allow. Going to it's question that Bible it, it, anyway. It comes from first from the parents, you know, from the family. 
from, or from your own family it comes from the first thing then the priest <laughs> then school <laughs> then school then the government then the government ah oh. then the, you get a job and it comes from the co corporation yeah the same thing same thing which is that this world matters Ugh. right we have to stay here yeah you have to take care of this stuff mm. well but what happens at the time of death when you can't take care of this stuff anymore you know what about that oh we don't talk about that <laughs> We would just fill you full of drugs so you shut up and, you know... Showing that the heaven is somewhere, keep you, you are, to do your Keep things. you alive as long as possible, even though you're miserable and in pain and, uh, you know, lost your mind and whatever. I mean, it's a horrible culture. It's a horrible culture. At least, you know, in Vedic culture back in the days... Um, I mean, even if people wanted to fight, they, there were rules for fighting, you know. And one of the rules was you don't take the fight to the citizens. You don't destroy infrastructure, you know. Uh, you uh, keep the battle on the battlefield between the troops of the opposing kings, you know. And the whole thing was regulated. And, <clears throat> you know, that's still the way it is in these other planets, these higher planets. Uh, the demigods are always fighting the demons, and they're both very powerful. Sometimes the demons win, sometimes the demigods win. But higher than that is Shiva Loko, which is beyond all that kind of nonsense. It's nothing but love. It's just pure love. And Shiva, you know, Shiva's always a joker, and he likes to play with his devotees. <laughs> he will assume a form uh, that's just perfect for each one of his devotees. See, so, uh, you know, in, in my case, my Ishta Devata is this form of Shiva, you know? And for a long time he was joking with me and he, he didn't reveal his actual identity, but then I figured it out. <laughs> what was that? Well, I figured it out because when I met Shiva, uh -huh. actually worshiped Shiva directly, uh -huh. I mean, it was just obvious. He was the same person as my Ishta Devata. Nobody else has that kind of attitude, that kind of, I mean, you know, it's just like, you know somebody, right? You're really close friends with somebody. And then you go to a Halloween party and you, you run into them in costume. Huh? <laughs> how long is it, I mean, how long is it going to take you Damn. to recognize Yeah. Right? All they have to do is say something, and it's like, oh, yeah, Steve, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing, I got you, Shiva, I got you. Yeah, there's nobody else like Shiva. Nobody else. So uh, when he comes in a different form, with that same attitude, he's instantly recognizable, you know, if you know Shiva. But see, he set things up, he set up my astrology and my culture and everything, the in environment I was brought up in, even my first guru and everything, to hide from me. Even though he was revealing himself in one form, he was hiding himself in his true form. But you know. What a joker. <laughs> what a joker. Then finally I ran into him in Rishikesh and realized the truth. Ha! Caught you. <laughs> Caught you. He loves that kind of stuff. I mean, uh, it's just too much. These little puzzles and, and, you know, games and stuff like this. And, you know, for him to go from one planet to another or one universe to, or one state of consciousness to another, this is nothing for him. He has, he has like, access to it all, right? So for him, you know, to go from one planet to another or something like that is just a normal thing that everybody does, don't they? <laughs> See, he's as far beyond us as we are beyond, like, ordinary conditioned human beings. So, you know, the things that seem obvious to us and clear and immediately verifiable simply by observation, to most people are like, whoa, dude, you know, <laughs> far out, man, you know. 
uh, there is a great deal of skepticism. And of course, uh, the, the people, the detractors who are going to spread disinformation about me don't help, you know? But uh, still, we see a lot of these people, these like commercial people who run courses and stuff like this, and they're going around offering seminars and what have you and whatever, and charging money, uh, sometimes a lot of money. <laughs> and, but they have so many followers, you know, but we don't. We, we don't really have any close followers or anybody who is really like studying um, as far as I know. I mean, there could be somebody off in the forest somewhere in the shadows of the internet, you know, and they just haven't come forward and said hi. But um, the people who have come forward have always revealed themselves at some point to not be getting it and also not being open to correction. You know, like one guy came and uh, we did a lot of like online conversations and stuff like this um, for like over a year. And then it finally came out that he doesn't actually believe in the Vedas. <laughs> I was like, what? You know, why should you follow this course or why should you try to learn this stuff if you don't believe that it comes from a higher than human intelligence? I mean, it was obvious to me, you know. Isn't it obvious to others? This is like beyond human intelligence? Like, yeah. Could any of us sit down and write this stuff? No. I don't think so. I mean, if you ever read Mahabharata, even if the whole thing is fiction, it doesn't matter. It's so intelligently written, my God, with such a deep understanding of human nature and spirituality and just everything. Even if the whole thing is total fiction, it's valuable simply for its point of view, which is like highly intelligent. Yeah. And same with the Bible. Well, any any of the Vedic yeah. religions, but especially the Upanishads. Upanishads. Upanishads are just nectar, amazing nectar, you know. <laughs> and these days, talk about nectar. I'm reading Shankaracharya's commentary on Bhagavad Gita, and wow. I mean, you never looked at Bhagavad Gita like this before because he starts out right from the beginning with this very same realization that everything is Brahman and what appears to exist that, uh, like, independently can only be illusion because it has a beginning and an end. <sighs> he starts from there. That's his first commentary on the, <laughs> the first verse that Krishna speaks to uh, instruct Arjuna. Very interesting. Uh, yeah. And then <laughs> there's so many verses throughout the Vedas. Oh my God, I could find 20 of them in about five minutes that support this exact same view. Rtehritam yat pratiyeta yat pratiyeta tatvataha Huh? in Srimad Bhagavatam. Whatever appears to exist without being related to me, know this to be that illusion which appears in darkness. See? The reflection of the reality, oh, this is like so deep, I could go on all day about, <laughs> no, seriously, <laughs> that Everything that we think is real is only the reflection of something real. Let's analyze it through grammar. I can say, this microphone exists. This microphone, is, I'm implying that it's real. Mm -hmm. Okay? But we're really talking about two things here. One is the microphone, and the other is existence. Yes. See, the concept of existence itself forms the background for asserting that the microphone is real. Okay. All right? So, if we look into this concept of existence, we find that the microphone did not exist 
prior to a certain date when it was manufactured. Yes. And now it's sitting here. But in the future, sometime or other, it's going to stop working and get thrown away, and then who knows where it goes. Yes. Right? It eventually gets broken down into its components, elements, and blah, blah, blah. So can we really say that it exists, that it's fully real? Huh? Because there are certain causes that brought it into existence at a certain date. And similarly, it'll go out of existence. So we can't really say it's fully, 100%, totally, and especially independently real. Shankaracharya gives the example of the pot and the clay. We see the pot, but the pot only exists because it was thrown by a potter. Before that, it was clay. When it exists before us, it's still clay. And then after it's broken and it goes back to the earth, it re the clay remains. So what he's saying is that Brahman, or existence itself, sat chit ananda Sat means eternal existence. Existence. Yeah, unconditioned existence. And chit means consciousness. Ananda means bliss. So the sat part of the sat chit ananda is the unspoken assumption See, and it actually reflects on the viewer, the experiencer, the seer. Drik uh, drishya vivekaha, to discriminate between the seer and the seen. The microphone is seen, but the one who sees it is the one who actually exists, ultimately Brahman. And that Brahman, that reality of existence, is being reflected by the microphone. microphone. It does, it's not inherent in the microphone, mm -hmm. which is essentially non-existent. It has, has not existed for, you know, what is it? 3.9 billion years or however long the universe has been yeah. in existence. And, you know, in a few years, it's going to go out of existence again for the rest of who knows how long. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, it just exists for a second. It's gone. Poof. You know, now, how can we say that's real, right? It's only relatively or temporarily real. Condition, Condition. has limits. So, Brahman is not conditioned. Brahman has no limits. But we can't say that, you know, in one sense, we can't say that Brahman is real or unreal. It's beyond all those distinctions, see? There's a certain level where viveka, dis discrimination, distinction, is necessary. And that's the vivartavada. Vivartavada means meditation. Not this, not this, not, huh? Rejecting everything until finally there's nothing left. And that's the entrance into sushupti, which is the doorstep to turiya, right? So... <laughs> See, I see this all as one thing. Uh, because, you know, where I come from, back in my neighborhood, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, we all see like this. Yeah, and there, there is no, there's no barriers, you know. There's just no barriers. Um, you are me and I am you and us is them and we are all together. Right? What's that song, The Walrus? <laughs> you know, in a way he's right, but the oneness is on the level of Brahman. It's not on the mental or the physical level. It's not even on the spiritual level, because even on the spiritual level, one can still be an individual and a person and have a form and all that, you know. But it, it's actually very subtle material. It's like forms in sushupti, on the very border of svapna, where the forms are very insubstantial. Right? Uh, and then even that goes away at the end of the universe, and everything merges in Brahman, and that's the end of the story. <laughs> but that's the real story. See, not like, I was born on a mountaintop in Tennessee, and my name is Rocky Raccoon. <laughs> That's not the real story, no. And all this other drama that happens around that 
It can't be, because it has a beginning and an end. So, like, drop it already, you know? If people did, even just give up their whole origin story and all of that, you know, fabrication, the world would be a whole different place. But it appears that people aren't ready to accept this message. You know, so I've done really the best I can to present it as it is, without any compromises, without any dilution due to trying to mix the seeing and communicating the truth with some kind of mundane project like an ashram or <clears throat> seminars or sell, even selling books, right? We just don't do it. And so uh, maybe that limits our reach in certain ways and stuff, but it maintains the, the purity of our precious bodily fluids and our teaching. <laughs> That's a quote from Strangelove, Dr. Mm -hmm. Strangelove. Um, but no, seriously, all joking aside, uh, we want to be able to present the thing as it is without any coloration of, oh, and by the way, I need a donation to maintain my temple. See, If you need donations to maintain your temple, either you're going way over the top and, and over-endeavoring, which takes you away from sadhana, which takes you away from the truth, and entangles you in all this mundane deal and dickering about this and that, you know, leading the troops and all that, crowd control, you know. Or you renounce all that, and you, the other extreme is to go to the Himalayas and sit in a cave and then just merge right now, you know, get it over with. Or, but uh, in between there somewhere is a sweet spot, and that's what I'm trying to hit, where, okay, I, I get to use the modern facilities to talk about this stuff, but I try to do it in such a way that it's not at all colored by salesmanship, not trying to get you to join anything or do this or do that, you know? Although it would be wonderful to have a little group that meets I would not want to make any infrastructure like a clubhouse, you know, <laughs> for it. Although, you know, people are welcome to come and mm -hmm. chat like you do, but um, mostly they don't. And I've put myself out of reach um, because most of the people that were coming before when I was in India weren't qualified. They were just casual. They just wanted to get something. They didn't want to give something. So, um, you know, it's... Uh, always got to be a give and take. Any relationship is a give and take. So when you approach a teacher or a master or whatever, you want to offer something that's, you know, useful to them, that's valuable to them, to their mission. And then, you know, while you're there, you kind of, the conversation kind of slips into, well, what is this Brahman anyway? <laughs> you know, like Nachiketa is upfront about it. My third boon, I want to know about the self. And death is like, uh, are you sure? <laughs> you know, because he's thinking, if I tell him about Brahman, I have to give him the secret, you know, the secret of death. Death's, you know, proprietary, uh, what is that called? IP. <laughs> IP. <laughs> Has to release his source code. Oh. <laughs> Open source it. Open source it. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. So yeah, that's what we're doing. We're open sourcing death's source code. <laughs> this is a crazy analogy, but if you understand software, you'll know what I'm talking about. And you know that's another big reason that people are afraid. When they start even thinking about this stuff, it's like all kinds of alarms go off. The ego is going, no, no. <laughs> you know, so they really don't even want to go there, right? But a lot of these poor people, I mean, their job is like tracking me and stuff like this. So they have to listen to this stuff. <laughs> 
<laughs> they must be in an, an intense, uh, what's that called? Cognitive dissonance. <laughs> you know, so uh, that's one advantage to being an object of uh, censorship and, and government meme control is that uh, the enemy has to listen to your stuff. I mean, they're more devoted to me than any of my followers have been. They've stuck with me for over 20 years now. So, I mean, you know, I still get every once in a while, one of them, will, you know, raise their head up somewhere. And of course, I immediately whack it down. But I see you guys. Yeah, I know you were, you're out there. So, uh, you know, after I leave, which is going to be, you know, fairly soon, fairly short time, um, then this knowledge can explode, you know, or it could disappear. I'm not sure what's going to happen. Depends on you guys. If you want, you can download copies of all this stuff. It's all on Internet Archive, you know, or you can, you can get it off of YouTube or whatever. Or, you know, the links on the videos go to the transcriptions and so on. And it's all kept up to date now. I finally got all that together, you know. Um, and keep it. Spread it. Maintain it, do it, you know, benefit from it. But, uh, you know, the, the cost of being honest has been that I've been uh, restricted by, by hidden forces. And so uh, even though, you know, other people with a far less competent view of the Dwaita are getting thousands of followers and stuff, and we don't have any. Uh, so, of course, there's got to be something going on behind the scenes, you know? yeah. uh, it's just by inspection. <laughs> and I don't care, you know, frankly, I don't care. It's up to you to create the kind of world that you want to live in, you know, and I want to live in a world where everybody around me is strong and clear and self-realized and... Um, on the purpose of love and all of that good stuff. Godly people, actual godly people, not somebody who's just shilling for some cultural point of view or something like that. You know, I don't go for that, even within the Vedic realm. You know, salesmanship has no place in spiritual life, period. So I don't associate with people like that. I don't let them come close to me either. And the minute I find, you know, some attitude in a person, I kind of pass on them. I let them go. They should be, you know, seriously uh, dedicated to the truth, no matter where that leads. You know, so, yeah, I'm willing to accept the consequences of my views and stuff. Um, but I'm not willing to deviate from the truth, because that's my mission here. That's what I'm doing here. So anyway, does that help? Yeah. Understand? The... Yeah. I mean, you went some extent to it, and let's have another conversation of this again. The extent version of this. What's that? Let's have another conversation. I mean, different video. Okay, well, I'll see what kind of outrageousness I can come up with this yeah. week. <laughs> <laughs> Well, seriously, I have to take some time away because um, I've been really putting out a lot of videos and I'm just not getting the feedback that I need to stay interested, you know. Uh, it's like I've been doing this for 12 years straight now, actually longer if you go back to the previous uh, iteration when I was, uh, uh, you know, teaching duality. But uh, that was a stage, you know, and I, I needed to go through that, and my audience needed to go through that. And now we've gone beyond that, and we're in the stage of non-duality. And yeah, it's hard, but that means it's good. If it was easy, it wouldn't be very valuable. Yeah. You know? So anyway, we've been talking for a long time. Uh, thank you very much. Om Tat Sat Om Shakti Om Om Namah Shivaya <laughs>